Hey guys, your boy Chili here. Welcome back to Shallow Dive. Uh, there's something wrong with our Dorito. It doesn't spin. This is unacceptable. We must remedy. Now, we're all graphics programmers here. We know the deal. You want to spin your Dorito, you're going to need to bind a transformation matrix to your vertex shader and do the transformation in there. Fair enough. How do we do that in Direct 3D 12? Well, I mean, your boy has already shown you the diagram and we know that to expose things to our shaders we need to put them in the root signature so like normally when in direct 3d11 you'd put your matrix into a constant buffer and you'd access it from your vertex shader like that now we're going to do things similarly but a little different today um using the root signature so that means we should probably go into a little more depth on, you know, how the root signature works. So you think of the root signature as like a list of things that are exposed to shaders. There are three kinds of things you can put in the root signature. Uh, the simplest is you can put constants directly into there. So you can put floats or other values directly into your root signature um, at the granularity of D word. So one float, one D word. Uh, by the way, the maximum that you can store in the root signature is 64 D words. So you don't, you don't got a lot of space. I mean, 64 floats is not a lot for a modern uh, game engine to work with. So clearly that's not the only thing you can put in there. The other thing you can put in is you can put in descriptors into there. And that'll point to some resource. That resource could be a constant buffer, it could be a texture, it could be whatever. And that costs you two D words. Now clearly this gets you a lot more stuff you can bind since a single buffer could contain, you know, potentially maybe even gigabytes of data. Um, but in total, the number of buffers and textures and everything, you can't have more than 32 of them if you bind in single root descriptors. So that brings us to the third kind of thing you can bind in, which is a table of descriptors. So if we're thinking about this in terms of just constants and a constant buffer, this has zero indirection. The values are directly in the root signature. This has one level of indirection. The value is not in the root signature, but you can follow this descriptor to find the value. It's in the buffer pointed to by this descriptor. And this is two levels of indirection. So you follow this, this is a pointer to a table that has descriptors, and then one of those descriptors will give you your buffer where your value lives. So zero indirection, one level indirection, two levels of indirection. That's what you get. And when you can bind multiple tables, each with multiple descriptors, now you can have, you know, potentially hundreds of different resources bound. So now in the programming guide here, we have examples of root signatures. This one has pretty pictures for you. Very nice. So here's a descriptor, has one constant directly bound, no indirection. You can see the things that go into this information. The slot that is bound on the CPU side, the actual value of the constant, and then what that is referenced as in the shader itself. Here's an example where you've got two constants directly in the root signature, and then you've got a constant buffer view. So this is a pointer to a buffer somewhere else. Here you've got a constant that is four D words in size, bound to uh, register B3. And then you have a couple of pointers to descriptor tables. Each one of these contains an array of descriptors. So you see there's like, there's plenty of options for, you know, how, how complex you want this to get. But, um, for today, we're just going to look at the very simple example of, you know, binding one constant. This is going to be a matrix, so that will be 16 D words, and that will be bound to a single slot and to a single HLSL register. So let's, uh, let's do that. So now we're not going to define an empty root signature. We want to define a root signature with a transformation matrix. So normally you would pass in D3D root parameter pointer. That is an array of root parameters. Uh, so we got to create that now because we're going to pass that in here. So we make an array of D3DX root parameter and we'll just have one in that array. Make sure we zero it out. Uh, and then for the zeroth one, we call the init function, init as constants. We say how many D words are in this bad boy? And that's just the size of the matrix divided by the size of a D word, which is four, 
this tells you which register it's going to be bound to. So this will be B0. Uh, this one, register space, we won't worry about that right now. And then here, the visibility, what shader can see this constant, and it's going to be visible to the vertex shader. Then in our init function here, we're going to pass it in the size of root parameters and pointer to the root parameters. And there you go, blob is your uncle. We are gonna have that uh, signature all set up. Now this sets up the root signature. It tells us, you know, what constants to expect. You still have to actually set the values of those constants and you do that during your render. You use your command list. So in here, right before we draw, we're gonna bind our transformation matrix. So we create a matrix rotation around Z axis. Got to transpose that because row, column, major stuff disconnect between, you know, DirectX math and HLSL. And then you set graphics root 32 bit constants. So our zeroth constant, we tell how many D words are going to be set, pointer to the data. And what is this zero here? I guess you can set an offset from the start of the uh, root parameter if you wanted to, but we're just going to overwrite the whole thing. So the offset is zero. And then there you go, this should work. Okay, we have a distinctively non-rotating Dorito and uh, I just remembered something. Probably need to actually use it in the shader. So the way this works is a little different than in HLSL4. Uh, in 5, you define a struct for this thing, um, but you don't just say that this is a constant buffer. You then use that struct definition to template out constant buffer, give it a proper instance name, bind it to a register. And this is different because before, if you had created a constant buffer like this, you would just access it with like transform. Like it would basically bleed the members into the, the global space. But here you actually have it spaced within our, the name of our constant buffer thing here. So you have to do rote dot transform or whatever. So down here it works like so. We multiply our transform against the position that we got coming in, and that is... So what we do here is we replace this with uh, matrix multiplication. Multiply matrix against this vector to transform it. We've got to expand the vector from float 3 to float 4 because this is a four-dimensional thing coming in here. And it's all good. This will probably spin. Yay! Our Dorito is spinning success. All right, now you might think it looks kind of weird. It's like kind of distorted, right? Like it's always fat on the bottom, no matter which end is spinning in. And this is not too difficult to understand. Obviously, I think you guys know what's going on here. Um, our model is basically defined in the same space, NDC space, but then that is being stretched to the aspect ratio of our window, which is not one to one. And so we get some stretching in the X direction. Not a big deal, but uh, why don't we fix it while we're at it? While we're here, why don't we fix it? So just a quick refresher. This is what things look like in HLSL5. In four, looks like this, where you, you say C buffer, name of the thing, and you just do model. And then here you don't do like transform C buff dot model. You just do model. It's just in the global namespace. So I do like this uh, method of doing things a little better. I'm not going to lie. Now to fix the aspect ratio thing, it's like just basically a simple scaling uh, in the X direction. But we might as well set up our projection matrix and for the future. And if we're going to set up projection matrix, we should probably also set up view matrix, pull the camera back. We don't want it at origin when our geometry is at origin. So we'll set up view projection matrix. Shouldn't be too hard. So for the view matrix, quite simple. We pull the camera back by one unit in the Z direction. Uh, we're focusing on the origin and our roll of our camera is such that our head is pointing up in the Y. Very sane settings there. We also got to set up the projection. So for the perspective, we, uh, we give it the field of view. This is in the Y direction. Uh, aspect ratio near and far and it gives us a nice projection matrix there. I don't know if 45 is going to cut it for Y. It seems a little low, but we'll see. Maybe it's fine. And then we just got to combine the matrices. That looks like this. And now we should just be able to combine that with our model, our rotation, and get some good stuff going. So here we do rotation matrix is equal to this. So let's change this one to NVP, model view projection. 
So we multiply our rotation by our view projection and then we transpose that and that goes into our root contest. So this should now give us a non-distorted Dorito, a not such a wide boy. All right, I feel like this is probably not uh, exactly what anyone was expecting. Hmm. <laughs> all right, now you got my ass thinking, maybe we don't need the transpose in there after all. Maybe, because with just a single rotation, the transpose will just change whether you rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. But when you add a whole bunch of other stuff in there, it'll start to mess things up. So maybe I didn't need it after all. Let me see without the transpose. All right, that looks a lot better. It looks a little bigger than I would expect, but that could just be due to my field of view being kind of small. Let's bump this up to like 65 degrees. All right, that's looking pretty good. And the triangle seems to be nice and non-distorted, equilateral, as I defined it to be. Okay, well, I'm satisfied with this. One last thing I just want to quickly go over before we end this video. Uh, you can set visibility of each of your root parameters to one or more stages. Uh, if we were to set this one to pixel, I wonder what would happen. So now it's only visible to the pixel shader. So we're getting an error here. Parameter is incorrect. Interesting. So when we double click here, it seems like the, the error comes out when we try to create the pipeline state. And what it's doing, if we go back up to our DX layer here, root signature does not match vertex shader. So here's where it's saying, hey, vertex shader is looking for a constant buffer descriptor, but uh, it's not finding it because it's not visible. So there you go. There's a, there's what happens when your visibility is all messed up. Now here's an interesting little factoid. You can set shader visibility per root parameter, but you can also set a global visibility on the whole root signature. So if any shader stages aren't using the root signature at all, you can just say, hey, don't allow it access. And that can enable the driver to do uh, optimizations in some cases. So we could potentially do this for like a whole bunch of them, like pixel shaders and using anything from the root signature. Neither, I mean, we're not even using geometry, domain, hull, uh, mesh amplification. I threw the vertex shader in here just for fun to see if something blows up. Let's make this const. And then we can use these root signature flags in here, replacing that single flag with a whole bunch of flags. And yeah, as expected, we get an error and it is probably going to be maybe in the same place. Let's see here. Yeah, it's back when we build the pipeline state. That's when all the validation happens between your root signature and your shaders. Shader has root bindings, but root signature uses deny flag to disallow. So there you go. That can be like a small kind of optimization you can make if it's easy for you to track the fact that uh, you're not using a specific shader or that shader isn't using the root signature. Throw this in there and it might be an optimization. Get rid of that vertex from there. Allow input layout and vertex shader and deny unnecessary access to certain pipeline. There we go. Okay. So this, yeah, like I said, this can be a little bit of an optimization. You can get even more optimization by using uh, root signature version 1.1. That allows you to specify things about how descriptors change. But we're not going to worry about that now. This is enough. I just wanted to give you a little, a little look at some of the extra options that you can supply here. All right, just a couple of short things before we wrap things up here. Uh, first is you guys know how much I like my overloaded operators. So yeah, we can just do this with the DirectX math and it works fine. So let's do that. Same thing down here. We want to get rid of those nasty function calls and put those beautiful asterisks in there. All right, so that's first thing. Now the second thing is my original instincts were actually correct. Um, we should do a transposition here. So we'll wrap this in a transposition. Now the reason why it wasn't working before was because the uh, the vertex shader is a little bit messed up. So this order of multiplication isn't really the most optimal for the uh, for the GPU. It's better to put the vector first, then you put your matrix. Basically, the way that it works. HLSL is it does the math column major by default and that's the most efficient way for it to do it. Uh, now if you swap them around it still works but you get a transposed result swapping the order of multiplication the operands transposes and that's why doing a transposition here fixes that problem. 
And anyways, that's going to about do it for this episode. In the next episode, we'll do something a little quick. We're going to upgrade our triangle to a rotating cube, and that is going to require an extra thing to be bound to the pipelines. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you again with some more Shallow Dive.